Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Season 9, Episode 34 of the DFO Fantasy Podcast, presented to you by our friends at Betway. If you're going to place a bet bet on Betway, please play responsibly. Ontario only, it must be 19 years of age or older. As always, I'm your host, Brock Segan. With me is Dylan D. Berthier. We do not have Michael Beebe's body at the moment. We're going to kick the show off with everybody's favorite segment, D's Weekend Streamers. Uh, and then Beebs will join us in the second half of the show where we will break down a flurry of action that went down on this Wednesday. Uh, the trade deadline was supposed to be this Friday. I'm pretty sure we were not notified and it was moved up to Wednesday because there is a ton of movement today. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter at DFO Fantasy Podcast, actually just DFO Podcast, um, we we didn't really have a whole lot of ideas coming into today. Like, what are we going to talk about besides the weekend streamers? And then 100 trades went down and we were like, oh. This is easy. Let's talk about all these. So uh, without further ado, D, welcome in. Let's give the people the weekend streamers, and then we will talk about all of the juicy trade action that went down today. Let's do it. All right. So we got four games on Friday, 13 on Saturday, five on Sunday. So pretty typical weekend schedule. Uh, just three teams rocking the Friday, Sunday. Obviously, those are going to be the ones we're looking at in terms of getting some extra skater games into your lineup this weekend. Uh, and off the top, we got two teams that were just in the segment last week and performed rather well from us. First off is the Ducks uh, hosting the Stars on Friday uh, and then hosting the Islanders on Sunday. Uh, big question mark here is what their lineup is going to look like this weekend. Obviously, Henrik and Carrick moving out today to Edmonton opens up a lot of ice time, but also uh, McTavish, Terry, Carlson, all out injured right now, all without definitive timelines, so not Really sure who's going to be back this weekend and how that's all going to look, but um, might end up or might result in a lot of ice time for two skaters in particular, or a big increase anyway. But we'll talk about the injured guys first. Troy Terry, 44% owned, right wing eligible. Again, you know, Terry McTavish, Leo Carlson, going to have to monitor them going into Friday's game, uh, see if we get an update on any expected timeline, if they're even uh, expected back to return this weekend. But Terry, just one assist, no shots on goal in two games since returning from an upper body injury and out again tonight against the senators with an undisclosed injury you would assume it's probably related to the upper body injury that just had him sidelined but again they're not letting us know has not been disclosed but uh he did retake his usual spot on the top power play unit i obviously expect him to return to that probably a first line role with all the moves that they've had and the injuries they're dealing with if he is healthy this weekend i'd expect his usual shot volume and goal output to return to normal sooner than later if he is indeed healthy plenty of ice time to go around in this top six Uh, It's just a matter of whether or not Terry is healthy enough to capitalize on it this weekend. Mason McTavish, similar story, except he's actually been playing pretty well of late. Four goals, five assists in his last eight games. He's day-to-day with a lower body injury. So, again, we'll have to monitor his status heading into the weekend. Uh, And then Leo Carlson, another player that is seemingly set for an increased role following Henrique's impending departure, or or not impending at this point, just his departure. Uh, But like McTavish and Terry, also currently sidelined out with an upper body injury, could be a viable option in deeper leagues if he is clear to play this weekend. So keep an eye on DFO for injury updates there. Two guys that we do expect to be in the lineup this weekend, though, are Ryan Strom and Alex Kalorn. Ryan Strom, left wing, right wing eligible, 9% owned. He's got four goals, six assists in his last 13. Came through with two assists last weekend after getting dropped in the streamer segment, which was nice to see. Uh, And likely to see an increased role this weekend. Uh, you know, Henrik alone leaving opens up about 20 minutes of ice time in that top six. But obviously, if you're without the likes of McTavish, Terry, and Carlson as well, plenty of ice time for Ryan Strom to assume. So he's a juicy little piece available in over 90% of leagues heading into the weekend. And then Alex Kalorn, left wing, right wing, 18% owned here. Usage and shot volume have been up lately, and that's only going to go uh, further up given all the uh, injuries and the departures that we talked about. Two goals, one assist. 11 shots on goal in his last four games for Kalorn while playing over 18 and a half minutes a night. Uh, and certainly figures to feature heavily on the team's top power play unit and likely the top line as well, given all the absences up front. So Strom and Kalorn, uh, two solid vets this weekend. And then if Terry McTavish and Shallow Leagues or Leo Carlson are made available ahead of Friday's game, I'm certainly looking to get them in my lineup as well. And then moving on, we've got the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, the stars of our streaming segment last week, I, I really highlighted Matias Pacelli. Uh, and the post that goes up on the website every Friday, Nick Schmaltz as well. Both of them performed really well. Uh, Schmaltz, center right wing eligible. He was 90% owned when we talked about him last weekend. He jumped up to 31% owned as of today. Uh, and Coyotes got Detroit on Friday and then are in Chicago on Sunday. So not a bad pair of matchups for them. 
delivered with a pair of two-point performances after being featured last weekend. So hopefully you held on to him throughout the week. Uh, it was rather enticing to do so. They did have Chicago early in the week as well. And again, it's another solid matchup spread for the Yotes this weekend. Schmaltz is up to four goals and three assists in his last six games. It's worth noting they did not immediately reunite him with Clayton Keller following Keller's return to the lineup on Tuesday, which was a little bit disappointing and surprising, I might add. Uh, but I would expect to see them back playing together together this weekend. Uh, they can never stay apart for too long, uh, tend to find their way back to each other. So I'm assuming that'll happen before long. And again, would put money on it happening this weekend. And then Matias Michelli, left wing eligible, 6% owned. Last weekend, he's up to 14% owned now uh, today. So again, hopefully you jumped on him and held on him throughout this week uh, because he all he did last weekend was score a goal and had three assists over those two games, up to three goals and five assists in his last seven. Did see a six-game point streak come to an end on Wednesday, and his ice time took a disappointing hit upon Keller's return to the lineup. Uh, and again, was inexplicably dropped to the second power play unit. Uh, Dylan Gunther and Barrett Hayton maintain their spots there. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, Michelli did manage to fire five shots on goal in that game against the Blackhawks, which is encouraging, is encouraging to see. Excuse me. Uh, I'm not quite as high on him this weekend, given the unfortunate impact Keller's presence seems to have on his role, but simply given Michelli's talent and the favorable matchup spread, I think he is a viable option again this weekend. Uh, and then Dylan Gunther, another one that's a little bit difficult to project because like Schmaltz and Michelli, Gunther was on a tear coming into the week, but saw his minutes and usage disintegrate in Keller's first game back in the lineup, played just 15 minutes of ice time, managed just one shot on goal, though he was fortunate enough to maintain a spot, as I said, on the Coyotes' top power play unit. I do think when Schmaltz and Keller inevitably reunite at 5v5 that Gunther will be the biggest casualty, Michelli likely to maintain his spot on the team's second line alongside his usual line mates, Nick Jukestad and Lawson Krells. Uh, while Gunther will most likely be limited to a bottom six role with Logan Cooley. So because of that, I do prefer Schmaltz and Michelli to Gunther this weekend, but I do still think Gunther's a viable option given his recent form if you're a little late to the wire. Uh, and then the other team with the Friday-Sunday is the Minnesota Wild. They are in Colorado on Friday versus Nashville on Sunday, so not the best matchup spread. And the Wild opt for a bit of a top-heavy approach to their forward lines, which doesn't leave us with a lot of uh, quality options on the waiver wire. The name I like the most outside of the top line of Kaprizov, Erickson, and Boldy is Marco Rossi, center eligible, 6% owned. He's centering the Wild's second line of 5v5 and has maintained a spot alongside Minnesota's big boys on the top power play unit. He's pointless in his last six, uh, which is not great. But his shot production has been through the roof of late. He's got 18 shots on goal in his last five games. So look for him to break through on the score sheet this weekend if that trend continues. And the only other name that's really worth a mention here is Ryan Hartman, center right wing, 22% owned. Uh, I don't love his upside being limited to a role in the second line and power play unit and uh, given a shot volume of late, but it's hard to imagine him uh, adding, or it is hard to imagine him adding more than a single point two tolls this weekend, given that shot volume. So again, not as high on Hartman, but if you're a little bit late to the wire, uh, I think, you know, he's worth a mention, maybe worth a shot uh, to be sure. And then moving on to the goaltenders uh, again, a lot of copy and pasting going on this weekend because Calvin Carr looks to be set up with another fable matchup again this weekend. And once again, it is against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Picard was just minutes away from a shutout on Sunday against the Pens, but locked up the easy win, allowed just one goal and 23 shots en route to the 6-1 victory. Similar to last weekend, I think there's an outside chance he starts the front end of the back-to-back -back in Buffalo on Saturday, given it is an afternoon game. So again, just remember to make sure Stuart Skinner is confirmed for Saturday's game before you move to pick up Picard uh, ahead of Sunday's start. And then the other potential spot starting to keep my eye on is Kevin Lankinen, just 1% owned Lankinen. Has delivered in some favorable matchups this season. He's got eight wins and 12 starts, and he could be set for another one on Sunday afternoon in Minnesota. He last appeared in Anaheim on February 25th when he allowed just two goals on 31 shots and a 4-2 victory. The Preds are hot right now, as are the Wild, so we got a bit of a uh, bit of a uh, unstoppable force, meaning an immovable object there. But I like their odds of the Preds picking up the win in Minnesota on Sunday. Similar to the Oil, they do play an afternoon game on Saturday, so just make sure UC Saros gets confirmed for that one before you move to pick up Lincoln in on Sunday. As always, absolutely juicy, juicy weekend streaming segment. Uh, as far as a couple of those items go, uh, for the Ducks, uh, I would imagine that most likely the only guy that they'll, they'll get back is uh, Troy Terry. He seems to be the closest of the group. Uh, Mason McTavish, McTavish was seen uh, wearing a walking boot. Uh, they confirmed that he doesn't have any broken bones in his foot. So, you know, probably not going to be out for like the remainder of the year or anything, but does seem like he's probably 
uh, going to be out for, for quite some time. And the Ducks still have not provided any update at all on Leo Carlson, so it remains to be seen uh, when he's going to be back. They were already uh, really kind of, um, you know, using some load management with him earlier in the season and with the season all but, you know, forgotten for them at this point. I would be pretty surprised if they rushed him back in any capacity at all. So, um, yeah, you know, there's there's the Ducks. There's going to be some big minutes up for grabs for for a, a variety of players in that lineup moving forward. I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you see some other, um, you know, some other prospects come up and see some, ad, you know, additional ice time here in the next coming weeks as, yeah, their season is, is, is just destroyed. I sent out a tweet this afternoon. Um, they faced the Ottawa Senators this evening. And yeah, like without, you know, following that trade and with all the injuries, they are just left with nobody. No Trevor Zegers, no Troy Terry, no Mason McTavish, no Leo Carlson, now no Adam Henrique or Sam Carrick. Absolutely brutal. You're missing literally your top four centers. <laughs> like every center that you had to start the season is out of the lineup. So uh, yeah, best of luck to the Anaheim Ducks as they close out the season. But thank you, D, as always. Make sure you go and scoop up those uh, picks I, I in my weekend or, or my full week strength of schedule and streaming targets post uh, at the start of the week here, the Coyotes had the second most favorable schedule. So I've got a couple of those Coyotes on my rosters already. Hopefully a uh, decent start so far. Hopefully they can kind of roll into uh, a strong weekend and, and coming off a pretty brutal loss, the Chicago Blackhawks, you would imagine that the lineups will probably shake up a little bit. You can certainly see uh, Keller and Schmaltz reunited. So that was D's weekend streamers. We are now going to welcome in Michael Beebs Bondi and turn our focus over to all of the trades that we saw go down on a busy, busy Wednesday. What's going on, fellas? It is uh it's an exciting time right now, and uh and I am just as jazzed up. It's great seeing you know every single update that we get go through. It's a little exciting, makes me feel like a kid again, looking at trade trackers and all that fun stuff. I am doing good over here, um, and I am ready to talk about uh, who's moving where, what's going to happen fantasy wise, and uh, you know what's juicy about it. So, uh, so yeah, I'm glad that we didn't. Uh, my intro today didn't start with a lookalike comparison. Um, so we're doing positive today. It's uh, don't bring it up. We go up. There we go. We, uh, before we dive in here, I just want to. Were you guys like the type of guys that? We're all like trying to be like, hey, like, yeah, mom, I'm sick. I'm not going to school today on trade deadline day. Like, I, I feel like I never went to school on trade deadline day. And I just sat on my couch, glued to TSN every every year. And it was, was uh it, it was just such a fun time of year. Like, I feel like it used to be better. Like, they, yeah. they make so many trades like this a couple of days ahead of time where the actual trade deadline isn't quite as fun as it used to be. But boy, man, when we were in high school, it was like, it was what a time to be alive. Bobby yeah, that's what I was saying. Pretty- until we got to like high school and then we had smartphones in the early days of Twitter, then, you know, you weren't really missing too, too much. Um, but yeah, that was always a, an ideal card to pull. And you really had to bank those sick days. Cause you know, mom keeps track. She's got a, she's got a rolling count in her head. So you really had to, to bank them when trade deadline. It was coming up for sure. No. Yeah. No definitely could take too many sick days in February. Cause you knew March was going to be a big day for you. You had to take you had to take the elite approach. You had to go. I'm going to be the Frank Saravalli of my school, and that's the way I would do it. I would like run to the computer lab in the library. I'd figure out what trades happen, and then I'd run into the classroom and like tell all the boys. It was kind of like my favorite thing to do. And on that day, I was popular, so it was like my one day a year I could be popular. So trade deadline uh, helped me in that way. But no, I was like a total keener in school, so I had to go, and I was never thinking about skipping. But that meant that I was then like taking a lot of bathroom breaks, and then I would come back in and be like, fellas, fellas, fellas. We got Steve Ruch into, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that guy ever got traded. But, I don't um, think that timeline lines up, but I, I love the name. <laughs> we got Ed Jovanovski going to Florida. There we go. That's uh, that's what I'm pulling out. But no, it was uh, it was exciting times. I remember like the days when you didn't get the updates right away. So you'd go and it'd be like, then you'd get, you know, your, your 10 updates at once. Or when, you know, like TV was the only way you got those updates. That was also quite exciting. So. Steve Ruch sure was traded happens. once in his career, um, but... It was in 2005, and he was traded in August. So I doubt you were in school breaking trades. In August 2005. Summer school. They were teaching. 2005, you, how to read, so. you would have been like 11 years old. So if you were in summer school in 2005, it would have been rough. Built but, uh, all rock. right, Built we got rock. lots of trades to talk about. We're going to start with the first deal that happened uh, late Tuesday, uh, which was Anthony Mantha going from the Washington Capitals to the Vegas Golden Knights. Anthony Mantha. Uh, 50% of his salary was retained by the Washington Capitals in exchange for a second round pick in 2024 and a fourth round pick in 2026. Now, Anthony Mantha, 
um, was part of a massive trade originally that was from Detroit to Washington. Um, you know, uh, Jacob Vrana never really uh, lived up to his billing in Detroit, ended up getting waived. Mantha really struggled his first few years in Washington, but has really come on this year and, and really found his game, uh, scoring 20 goals, 14 assists, 34 points in 56 games so far this year. Lands in a pretty good spot in Vegas. I do, you know, I, I'll be interested to see. He's expected to make his uh, Vegas debut tomorrow on Thursday. I'll be interested to see where he lands in this lineup because, to me, there's a lot of possibilities for him. I do think that this is a trade that could really help Anthony Mantha, um, you know, at least sustain what he's, you know, his current fantasy value. Uh, he was playing pretty sizable minutes in, in Washington, uh, but still only around 14 minutes a night. What, you know, pretty casual Anthony Mantha stuff. I doubt he's going to see many more minutes. But if he does land on a line, uh, whether it's with Jack Eichel or William Carlson, I do think there's, you know, plenty of value there. Uh, and it's probably still going to operate on a, on a power play unit as well. So I, I do think this move to Vegas can help maintain, you know, this 20 goal season that uh, Mantha's had so far, but still probably going to be on the edge of you know fantasy uh your fantasy lineup do you, what do you think about anthony mantha moving forward in vegas yeah I, I don't know if it'll shake out too differently for him in terms of his production the rest of the way forward it's not like he's moving to a, a team with what's been an excellent power play this year nine uh, 19 and a half percent so marginally better than the 18.8 percent that the capitals were operating at um so yeah it, it's I think the best case for him would be dislodging someone like Barbashev or Amadio in that top six. Uh, Barbashev, I think, has a lot of value there, but we've also seen him be deployed in the bottom six pretty effectively, not just with the Golden Knights, but the Blues before that. Uh, and I think Amadio is, is probably the one that's primed for the taking right now in terms of whose spot he could possibly um, take over in that top six. So, uh, yeah, I don't. I agree with you. I don't think he's going to get too much extra ice time here. Uh, and I think we'll probably look at him in a pretty similar light as we did with the Capitals this season, that being more of a short-term value or streaming target when the schedule lines up. It actually turned out kind of kind of crappy that he's just played so well lately in Washington because I know a lot of people or a lot of leagues that I was in, I kind of went to go look and he was already picked up last week because he'd just been on a little bit of a heater recently here. I totally agree though, boys. I think it's kind of like a parallel move, just the all the changes. Um Kind of, they, they all just even out, but that's okay. I do think that he's definitely worth a flyer if you're in one of those leagues where you can get a hold of him. You have an extra roster spot because, like Brock said, anything we don't really know for sure what's happening tomorrow. And if he's if he's up in that lineup, um, you know, 20 goals, 56 games in is is nothing to scoff at. But if you say you you don't have anyone to drop, I wouldn't be too upset if you can't get your hands on Anthony Mantha. Um, but definitely worth keeping an eye on these first couple games. Natural goal scorers never really been able to you know show that junior goal scoring touch that he was kind of touted for coming in but maybe you know vegas tends to bring out the best in players we might see it again and i might hate it seeing it just because you know it happens so often yeah he, he's got an absolute tremendous shot still um Huge. just seven percent owned in yahoo leagues right now so widely available uh across many leagues and i do think that you know not somebody i'm rushing to the wire for immediately but if he, you see the vegas line combos on daily face off tomorrow and he's up at the top of the lineup and certainly something that I would be moving to the wire to grab. 7% on Anthony Mantha at the moment. Uh, okay, now moving to today, many trades, and it started around uh, noon Eastern time, and it started with Vladimir Tarasenko moving from the Ottawa Senators to the Florida Panthers. Uh, the Senators received a 2025 third-round pick and a conditional 2024 fourth-round pick, which becomes a third-round pick in 2026 if the Florida Panthers win the Stanley Cup this year. Uh, Ottawa retained 50% of Tarasenko's deal as well. So just $2.5 million cap hit for Tarasenko. Uh, many people on Twitter uh, were very disappointed or with the return that the Senators got, but it's, you, know, you have to mention that he had a full no-move clause. He really wanted to go to Florida, so the Senators' hands were tied. And I do think that you know, obviously signing him to a one-year deal in the summer with a full mo no move, that was the real mistake. But with what they were dealt with today, uh, or you know, I do think they did Win. an okay job of getting uh, a decent return there. But obviously, a huge steal, I believe, for the Florida Panthers. So um, Tarasenko was a guy that on last week's show we said I would be picking up right now because we think that he could absolutely get a fantasy boost if he gets traded next week. And that's exactly what happened. I don't know exactly where he's going to land in this lineup. Uh, I think the real issue for him is that he doesn't really have the flexibility to play the left side. We haven't seen him play on the left side most of his career. He is a left shot, so I think he can do it. 
Um, but he's been primarily a right winger, which to me probably suggests that he lands with Matt Kachuk and Sam Bennett with Matt Kachuk moving over to the left side. Uh, but he could certainly wind up on the top line with Barkoff and Reinhardt as well, you know, reuniting that for Hagi Bennett, Kachuk line if Tarasenko does go to the left side. Either way, I do think he ends up probably in this top nine or top six, excuse me. I doubt he scratches the top power play unit, but uh, if he lands in that top six in Florida, this is a top six that's absolutely dominant at 5v5. And I do think that he does receive uh, a pretty sizable fantasy boost right now. So hopefully you listened to us last week and picked him up before you know this happened because he's already up 8% owned in the last 24 hours uh, to 57%. So uh, somebody that I still want to get my hands on if possible. And uh, Beebs, where do you land on Terrace Lankley? You were right there with me last week as somebody that yep. you definitely wanted to pick him up. Super happy to contribute to that 8% today. I will say that as much as uh, you know, we talked about get, picking up Mantha. This is the one that I was sprinting to the wire to. Um, and very happy about it. Like you said, that top six is, I, I think we can use insane now um, because it's very, very nice out in Florida already considered like one of they're already leading the NHL in shots on goal. And they just added a guy who loves to put close to three on net per game um, in his good day. But, uh, but at the same time, it, it, I think that this helps Tarasenko. We've, we've seen that line Bennett and Chuck are going to take the greasy corner plays. I could just see Tarasenko sitting there and feeding. I don't think that he's a point per game player because that's asking a ton considering he hasn't done that in three years. But with that said, he had 41 and 57 in Ottawa. Um, I kind of have him just a little bit over that pace, just a little bit better, but, um, but a little bit better is enough to have him fantasy owned since he was on the cusp in a lot of leagues. Even while in Ottawa, you said the power play stuff. Usually we say attack the power play. If people are on it, I think this is one of the teams we can obviously take an exception for um, like Colorado, like Toronto that we've seen in the last couple of years, if a guy isn't on there. So definitely someone I'd be sprinting to get um, because I do think it's uh it's going to be a resurgence for Tarasenko here. We mentioned on last week's show, he's playing for money too. So um this is uh this is a prove it bit here in Florida, and you know that he's gonna come, he's gonna jump in, he's gonna buy in, and uh and, and things are going really well out there. So I uh, I would definitely look to grab him. Um, as far as trading for him, I'd maybe not jump too quick and give up too much value, but I would certainly, you know, he is intriguing. Um, D, I might need you to knock me down a peg here though if I'm a little too excited on Tarasenko, or just keep no, it going. I, I... I agree. I mean, if he is out there and I have seen him on the waiver wire in, in, the, in a couple of leagues, especially shallower leagues, like 10, 10 team formats, he's certainly uh, been out there quite a lot this season. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard to argue that his upside won't be better in Florida. Um, I, I do kind of want to just walk back, maybe patting Steve Stales on the back over this return, simply because I don't really get the benefit of making this trade two days before, like the one card you have to play if he's only going to one team is play chicken up until the deadline and just say, you know, if you're not going to give us our asking price, that's fine. We'll just hold him. You know, there's not a lot of value in two mid round picks for us. Obviously the one risk in doing that is the Panthers looking elsewhere. Um, but it's hard to imagine that they still wouldn't be down to cough up a third and fourth round pick for Tarasenko in a couple of days, even if they did move for one of the more premium wingers. So yeah, that 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 was the part that I just didn't get. Like you clearly are taking him or giving him away at a discounted rate because of the no movement clause, sure. Uh, but why not at least try to exercise your only option and, and like I said, play a game of chicken, hold on as long as close to the deadline as possible and try to at least get a second rounder for him. So uh I, I, I definitely feel for for sense fans that are upset with the return and just because I think the timing of it doesn't make a lot of sense. But fantasy wise, I, I totally agree. I think he's got uh, unquestionably more upside playing uh in sunrise. Yeah, that's been, in in my opinion, two underwhelming values in Ottawa and their two big trades in the last little bit between Debrinkat and Tarasenko. Um, but again, like you said, hands are tied, makes things very hard. Poor, you know, in Ottawa, I do, I'm with you there, D. I feel for their fans. It's uh, it's hard enough to get to that arena as it is. Now they got to deal with this. Oof, it's not, uh, you know, not pretty out in Ottawa. It's, it sucks too, because this was an exciting, an exciting top six to start the year. Yeah, it's an exciting start to the season for Sens fans, and it has not gone the way they had planned. Uh, and when you don't get goaltending, that's what happens. Um, okay, yeah. the the names Anthony Mantha and Vladimir Tarasenko were certainly among the most popular names uh, being floated around as we led up to the trade deadline. Two names that weren't getting nearly as much attention were Casey Middlestad of the Buffalo Sabres and Bowen Byron of the Colorado Avalanche. And they ended up getting flip-flopped for each other in a one-for-one -one deal, uh, which is very, very interesting. Middlestad's had a really nice year 
Uh, you know, a bit of a disappointing start to his career as a whole, but he's really come on in the last couple of years uh, to be a really solid two-way middle six, primarily number two center in Buffalo. 59 points in 82 games a season ago. He's up to 47 points in 62 games this year. Uh, on pace to set a career high in goals as well. Uh, could get to 20 for the first time in his career. So uh, we'll start with Casey Middlestad. The jump in ice time has been a huge 15 minutes, uh, 44 seconds a season to go up to 18 minutes, 16 seconds this year. He's landing in uh, Colorado where he will almost certainly take over for Ryan Johansson, who was also traded by the Colorado Avalanche on Wednesday. We'll get to that one a little bit uh, later. But Ross Colton's had to play a lot of heavy minutes for the Abs this year, and he's probably better suited as a third-line center where Middlestad can be a guy that, like I said, can play a reliable two-way game. He could end up with, you know, whether it's Drouin, Lekkanen, Nachushkin, Parise. Like, he's going to have some good wingers, most notably Nachushkin on his wing, most likely. And I do really like the addition of Casey Middlestad. I do think that it helps his fantasy value a little bit, but I don't think it's going to go too crazy. He was still playing with pretty talented wingers in Buffalo. He's still uh, playing a hefty amount of minutes. I would imagine that his usage probably comes down a little bit in Bu in uh, Colorado. Probably not going to see the top power play unit. So uh, his, his value overall might take a little bit of a hit, uh, but I still think that he is fine in this uh, new role. And I really, really like the addition for the Avalanche. I'm not so sure in, you know, when you take a look at these two trades, it still feels like there's another move to come. So I don't want to judge what the abs have done so far quite yet. You know, next week we'll maybe talk about the grand scheme uh, of what happened in, in a, you know, three or four trades, depending on what other moves they have to come. But as it stands right now, I believe they have 4.75 million. Uh, sure do. In cap space as we approach Friday. So it certainly feels like there's another move to come. And, and I think it will make all of these other deals make a little bit more sense. Uh, D, I know you have a little bit of an issue uh, with the signing of Ryan Johansson and the pickle that it put them in in this situation to begin with. But uh, we'll start with Beebs because Beebs, you're a resident Avalanche fan. You know, Bowen Byram, obviously, as, as an Avs fan, uh, I saw a lot of. Um, Avs fans very upset today. Like the, the Bowen Byram mm -hmm. is a player that they had very high hopes for. Uh, never really lived up to those expectations. Was you know always playing um, you know less minutes than he probably deserved because of the, the talent around him. Uh, but just also couldn't really stay healthy. As an Avs fan, how do you feel about this Bowen Byram uh, trade? As you pan your camera over to your Bowen Byram jersey. Yeah, um, this one hurt. Uh, it was always in the talks, but it was never something that you thought really would come to fruition because he, he, this kid's so talented. But I think when it comes down to it, it was just health. And, uh, you know, when I when I stepped back and, and took away my my pure love of this kid, because I always thought I was like, we got Makar number two here. Um, when it, we Colorado needed that center um, so bad, so bad. And Byram, just with the health concerns, who knows if you make it to the playoffs and and is it and. I mean, the guy's the guy's not even 24 yet, and he misses half the season often. Um, if this kind of, you know, if this happens near the playoffs, you've lost a complete asset there. So to have Middlestat, a guy who's proven, you know, that he can stay pretty much healthy the last two years. He played 82 games last year. Um, and, and like we said, it just shores up that middle. And we kind of saw it. It's so hard to judge all these moves, like because you have to consider Walker coming in now. Like you said, there's there's still so much more to happen. So who really knows? Um, in the end, but but I uh, the way I put it, I think that Byram is a better player than Casey Middlestat. But I think you can depend on Casey Middlestat more than you can depend on Bowen Byram, and that's what it comes down to in the end. As far as fantasy, um, I think you nailed it. This is another parallel move, in my opinion. Casey Middlestat was playing 18 minutes a night out in uh, out in Buffalo. Likely, Colorado loves to lean on their top six. We've seen it. Brock hates it, um, but we have seen it, and uh, likely that top six is going to play you know 18, 19 minutes. So I could see him doing that again take away that power play time that he was getting. Well, I don't know. He wasn't even getting top tower play time, the little bit extra that he was getting out there, add in the players that he's going to be playing with. Um, Cause one thing that, like you said, that we add in here, people are going to look at Colorado's roster and say, wow, Drew and Parise on that second line. What are we doing here? But they forget that Nishushkin's coming in. Um, that's a guy who was over a point per game pace when he was in. And uh, prior to everything that we saw happen earlier in the year, um, there's going to be a lot better out in Colorado. And I think that middle stats going to kind of feed off that, but either way, I mean, he's on pace for over 60 points and, uh, and, and that's kind of where I see him ending. Even with this, with this addition here, he's going to be asked to play a little bit of a different role than he was in, uh, in Buffalo. So it's, uh, 
it, it's exciting, but I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be sprinting. I would rather go get Tarasenko than get middle stat, I think. Um, but obviously different positions. Um, if, if you are filling holes, but yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not super fantasy excited for middle stat, but I would, I mean, it's worth taking a chance on just, the, just the team in front of them. And, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to say that Florida's top six is worth having a guy in same thing for Colorado, of course. Yeah, he is currently, he's gone up 8% or 7% today. Uh, he's up to 29%. So still widely available in a lot of leagues. I do think that a, a potential middle stat and the Chushkin combo could be very, very good. Uh, whether or not it, 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 it releases, uh, unleashes great fantasy results remains to be seen. But as a real life hockey uh, duo, I do think that they could have success. Very uh, talented two way player in middle stat. Nice addition for the Avs. But D, uh, you you talking about this pre show, like obviously giving up the first for Sean Walker to get rid of the Johansson contract, um, you know, opens up their ability to make another move here at the deadline. But Signing Johansson to a two-year, four million uh, AAV deal is really what got him in the pickle in the first place. So you obviously don't love the deal uh, that they made. Just to give it, you know, we're not going to talk about it too much. It's not super, super fantasy relevant. But the other trade they made today was they brought in Sean Walker, defenseman from the Philadelphia Flyers, along with a 2026 fifth-round pick in uh, exchange for Ryan Johansson, who has a 4.0 million AAV cap hit. And they gave up a conditional 2025 first round pick that just is uh, top 10 protected. It slides to 2026 if the Avs happen to have a top 10 pick. Um, Yo, Hans also was immediately placed on waivers by the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, so obviously, John Tortorella does not want to deal with Ryan Johansson again. Uh, but D, yeah, you you were a little bit more critical of this deal. Obviously, Beebs is going to have to look through it with his rose colored glasses as an Avs fan. Needs to make himself feel good. Maybe uh, give us the other side uh, on how you feel about this deal. Uh, well, you know, it, it, like I said, that the contract they handed Johansson this summer was the bigger issue here. But I, I will give credit to, you know, it's not too common that we see um, a front office uh, basically admit their mistake this early on into what, what was, like I said, pretty bad signing uh, in Ryan Johansson. So I do give credit to Joe Sackick and, and Chris McFarland, the GM there. Uh, for kind of realizing the writing was on the wall there and it just wasn't going to work and kind of salvaging it, uh, what they could this season because they're obviously uh, at a point uh, with that franchise that they need to be all in every single season with the uh, the prime core that they have. Um, so I do give them a bit of kudos for that. But obviously, yeah, like that that originally was what um, facilitated this kind of move. However, I do think like this just helps with their roster construction and the balance of their roster either way. They're always a little bit heavier on the back end than they probably needed to be. Um, talked about how they were probably should have been open to moving Byram uh, in the past. I do think Middlestad's a really nice gift for him. I think I'm a little bit higher on his potential fantasy value than you two, which I'm a little surprised on, but he's been a terrific yeah. playmaking center the last two years. And um, to Beebs' point, they love handing out a lot of minutes in that top six. We saw Nazem Kadri have a ridiculous season in that same role a couple of years ago. Lack of shot volume is always going to limit Middlestad's goal scoring upside. Uh, so I don't think he can quite have like the 87 or whatever it was point campaign that Kadri had, but I mean, I, I do think he could flirt with 50 assists. He had 44 and 82 games playing under 16 minutes a night with the Sabres a year ago. And, um, you know, who's to say they don't go with a more balanced approach in their top six now and maybe give Rantanen some time with Middlestad. Uh, we've seen them do it in the past when, you know, they did have a little bit more depth to the team. So, um, yeah, I, I think all is up in the air. So I'm really looking to get him uh, on my roster right now if I at all can. People were quick to pick him up this afternoon, which is understandable, but. I, yeah, I really want to see how that lineup shakes out. I think he could potentially even um, usurp Arturi Lekkinen's spot on that top power play. I know he's been playing well, but I don't think that's like nailed down either. So there are some routes to some pretty significant production here, and I, I think he's going to be a great source of assists uh, with the Avalanche either way. It's just a matter of who he's playing with, how much ice time he gets, as to whether or not the point production really creeps up to anything elite. But I think it's a really nice move for them. They needed some more help down the middle, uh, and they were pretty, pretty deep on the back end. So you. Uh, you take slightly away from one of your strengths and what I, I, I think was looking to be maybe an overrated to a degree young piece in Bowen Byram uh, and shore up a weakness, which was down the middle for them. So I, I like the move. Yeah, it, it's worth uh, mentioning too. Ross Colton's had a really nice year. Like he, he's had to move into the second line role with Johansson struggling and Ross Colton's put up nice numbers. So uh, you'd think that middle status should be able to step in and, and at least maintain what he was doing in Buffalo with, you know, if, if not increase. And like we said, last year we seen, uh, some pretty good numbers from Lekkanen, McKinnon, and Nachushkin together as a unit. So there is certainly the possibility that Rantanen uh, lands with Middlestad, you know, if not immediately, but maybe down the road. So 
Uh, yeah. And then Crosby's like, got to go somewhere, right? Yeah. But I, I think, you know, now adding Middlestad probably takes them out of the running for the Sidney Crosby sweepstakes that aren't, that never started. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I really like the Middlestad addition for this team. I think it made a lot of sense. Ross Holton has been great. They, they now have uh, some very, very strong centers down the middle, you know, where they did it. Uh, a day ago with, with Ryan Johansson just not performing to his level. And uh, I, I don't think, you know, he's not going to be super fantasy relevant, uh, but I do think the addition of Sean Walker is a little bit underrated as well. Sean Walker is a very good puck moving defenseman um, and he's going to replace Bowen Byram totally uh, on that back end in, in, you know, basically what was a, a second or third pairing role. So uh, I do think that that move was a little bit underrated, obviously a little bit of sticker shock with the first round pick, but when you factor in getting rid of the Johansson contract, and again, we'll see what comes tomorrow, right? Like, uh, could they be in the mix for a Jake Gensel or, or something like that? Like they could make another really big splash. Um, and we could be sitting here being like, okay, the abs are once again, um, you know, the favorites in the Western Conference. We've obviously seen the Oilers make moves, the Vegas Golden Knights make moves, who we'll talk about in a minute here. This Western Conference, man, it's an absolute arms race right now, and I'm really, really excited to see uh, what happens in the next couple of days. But speaking of the Edmonton Oilers, their big trade uh, on Wednesday, they acquired Adam Henrique and Sam Carrick from the Anaheim Ducks. It was actually a three-way trade with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Ultimately, um, they get Adam Henrique at 75% retained. It's only 25% of Adam Henrique's 5.825 million AAV cap hit. So really nice uh, number there. And then also uh, Sam Carrick, they get him 50 17 from the Anaheim Ducks. So they, they uh, add some very cheap pieces now uh, to the roster. Uh, they gave up a 2024 first round pick to the Ducks. They also gave up uh, a 2025 conditional fourth round pick to the Edmonton Oilers, or sorry, to the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, the Ducks also received a conditional 2025 fifth round pick. So uh, obviously we're just going to focus on the player. Sam Carrick is a fourth line center. I think he's a an upgrade for them in the fourth line center role, but we're not going to focus on him too much uh, because the fantasy relevant player in this deal is Adam Henrique. Uh, and Henrique's value, man, uh, we talked about him last week as well. And I actually mentioned the Oilers as a potential landing spot for him. And his ownership has gone up 4%. He's up to 42%. His value could either completely erode if he lands as their third line center or slightly improve if he ends up in their top six. Um, I think they acquired him to be their third line center. So I'm not that excited. I'm probably going to be dropping out of Henry, uh, but he is expected to uh, make his uh, Oilers debut tomorrow. So you'll find out right away in the morning skate where he's supposed to line up here. If he's on the third line, probably doesn't have a whole lot of value. The good news for Henry is he's not a guy that's typically relied very heavily on power play production. So uh, he's not going to be on that top power play unit. You're not going to get that. In, that uh, There's extra points out of him, but if somehow he ends up on a line with um, Leon Dreisaitl potentially on the second line, maybe it's even Ryan Nugent Hopkins, uh, Henry and Evander Kane or something like that. I do think that he does still carry some fantasy value, but I, I think ultimately this trade was made for him to be uh, to solidify their third line center role. And he probably doesn't have a whole lot of value in that role. I think he's going to take away some defensive minutes from that second line, uh, allow the dry side of line to see some cushier matchups, which will benefit the dry side of line a lot more than it'll benefit Adam Henry. But uh, D how do you feel about Adam Henry moving forward now with the Edmonton Oilers? Uh, well, to be fair, I, I think we land, mentioned the Oilers as a potential landing spot for everybody uh, in the past few weeks. But, uh, you know, you knew they were going to add to that top nine. And I, I love this addition for them from, you know, a hockey standpoint, um, the flexibility it gives their lineup to, you know, they've already had a lot of versatility just in terms of, you know, dry saddle can play down the middle, obviously, or he can play up top with McDavid on the wing. It's same with Nugent Hopkins and Henrik just adds another layer to that. Um, so yeah, they could potentially on any given night go for a more top heavy approach uh, and just load up the top six or, and I think what they will like to do come playoff time is stretch the lineup out a little bit. Cause that's something they really haven't been able to do in the dry side of McDavid area. Um, but I have no doubt that there will be some experimenting with Henrique in the top six. Uh, you know, it's kind of been their MO for years now to really kind of move back and forth between those kind of builds. And that's continued under Nabla. So I, I do think he's going to get a look in kind of all aspects as we head down the stretch here and kind of see where the best fit is. Um, but yeah, we talked about it. He's been playing so much over the last couple of months and producing so well. He's a point per game over his last 23 games um, that it's just unlikely that he's going to see those kind of minutes and that kind of usage, even on a better team like the Oilers. 
Um, so yeah, I don't think, you know, he's going to continue to produce at the point per game clip that he's been at since basically the turn of the calendar year. Um, but I do think he easily maintains like the, you know, at where he's been at on the year at 42 points in 60 games. I think he's going to continue to be, you know, a usable piece in the short term, someone that you're going to want to stream anytime he does end up in that top six, but otherwise, um, maybe some of that we see bounce around on the wire a lot when he is dropped to that third line. So yeah, I love the addition for them. In terms of a fantasy ad, it's, it's not like he was brought in to play on McDavid's wing, right? He could potentially, like I said, and I'm sure he will get some looks there, and you're going to want to have him in your lineup on those nights that he does. Um, but, yeah, I think that's kind of where we're at with him is it's going to be more kind of short-term, seeing where he kind of fits in. Someone that I'm definitely, you know, happy to take a flyer on if I have the room in the roster and just see where he starts out. Uh, but I would expect, like you said, in the long term, come playoff time for him to be playing and centering that third line. Yeah, the, the one thing that you kind of alluded to that I noticed big time in a way um, with Henrik's wing and center flexibility, and, you know, McLeod has the same uh, flexibility, and Warren Fogel's really proven to be a guy that can move into the top six and, and, and is an effective third-line player as well. They have a lot of options. I had a really hard time trying to put together – a, a concrete, like solid, how I felt projected lineup for the Edmonton Oilers following these additions because they have so many, so much flexibility and so many moving parts, right? Like Dry Settle Hyman and McDavid have been playing together. They've been dominating games. Are they going to keep that trio together? Nugent Hopkins, McDavid, Hyman has been one of the best lines in the entire league all season, if not the best line. So do they go back to that? They just have so much flexibility, which they were so limited in recent years. So I really like the addition. Um, you know, I, I think that. Fans often get very tied up in, in the big names, right? Like, you know, Oilers fans wanted Jake Gensel and, and whoever else. Um, but I do think, like, you know, with what they gave up here, this is a nice addition. And I do think the Sam Carrick addition for the fourth line is also uh, going to be a welcomed move come playoff time as well. So uh, I really like the move from a hockey standpoint. And like you said, D, it's just going to matter where he is on any given night. You're going to have to just keep checking daily faceoff. And uh, we're going to get lots of traffic to the Edmonton Oilers page to see who is playing with McDavid or who's playing with Drysaddle on any given night because they are going to be streaming targets that week for sure. Uh, Beeps, any final thoughts on Adam Henrique? Uh, you are sitting there in an Adam Henrique uh, New Jersey Devils jersey at the moment. So uh, you must have lots of feelings about uh, Rico, as they call him. Sure am. I was just about to call him Uncle Rico um, coming in, so I'm glad that you uh, you prefaced that. But no, um, wearing the jersey because D and I went to high school with the guy, uh, got a support, and uh, he also we didn't know him, but he was he was walking our halls, and he I think also, he was three years uh, older than us, and he skipped eighty percent of his classes. But uh, sure, yeah. I remember sure, seeing we'll him. That. I remember seeing him with the gold medal after they won the uh, the World Juniors, though. So that's my that's like walk. I mean, how do you compete with anyone walk around school with a gold medal on? But uh, you don't. Um, so you step back. But he, um, Adam Henrique. I mean, you've gotten 42 points in 60 games out of him. He was a pickup off the waiver wire. If he doesn't work out for you, no love lost there. You kind of were expecting this. And and uh, I think, you know, we kind of nailed it last week when he said he's going to likely go somewhere where he's going to be asked to play what he was brought in the league to do, be a third-line center, be that, you know, role player, maybe maybe second-line center, but he's not going to get that in Edmonton. But still, um, you know, not to beat it too hard there, but I, I do think unless he gets moved up onto the wing, you know, you're going to lose a lot of your value, but that's okay. Um, as mentioned, it was a bonus anyways. So uh, it, it, say he does, uh, say you go on DFO and he isn't that top six, then you just keep enjoying your Uncle Rico time. Um, but until then, you know, it's a guy who's never put up more than 51 points in a season. So you couldn't have really been expecting a uh, a point per game player like you have gotten, as D mentioned, in the last 23. So it's uh, I think it's a phenomenal move for Edmonton. These are the moves you have to make to win a cup. And uh, but fantasy wise, sometimes they hurt us when we have a guy on a on a bad team who's getting a lot of usage. The next trade of the day was Alex Wenberg moving from the Seattle Kraken to the New York Rangers. Currently carries a four point five million cap hit, uh, but Seattle retains fifty percent of that contract in exchange for a twenty twenty four second round pick and a conditional fourth round pick, which will become a third. This is. Uh, initially from the Dallas Stars in the Niels Lundqvist trade. And that uh, one of the funniest uh, conditions on a pick we've seen in recent years, it was if Niels Lundqvist scores a total of 55 points over two seasons, uh, his first two seasons with the Dallas Stars, then that pick moves up from a fourth to a third. Uh, so then that condition now moves from the New York Rangers to the Seattle Kraken. Um, I believe he is only at about 33 points uh so far so i don't think two seasons i believe yeah but this two is the seasons. second season 
yeah, this is his second yeah. season. So he's got to get to 55 this year. He's about 22 points short, I believe. And I don't think he's likely to get there. So looking like a fourth round pick. But uh, yeah, we're not going to spend too much time on Wenberg here. This is a guy who has only one career season uh, above 40 points uh, or two above 40. One was right on 40. But uh, 159 point season. That was his career high back in 2017. I do like the move from a fantasy or from a uh, real hockey standpoint. Uh, I, I think that the, you know, with the loss of uh, Philip Heidel in New York, this is a team that was looking for a third line center. And I do think Wenberg fits that bill nicely. He's a solid two way player. Uh, he's certainly not going to shoot the puck a ton, but he's a good playmaker. He's a good two way uh, center and provides some stability down the middle for them. Uh, can take away some of those uh, tougher defensive minutes as well. I'll be interested to see if the Rangers have. Uh, any more moves up their sleeves because, you know, if they do elect to acquire uh, maybe some just kind of lesser names to, to provide them with a little bit more of a checking line on that third line with Wenberg, I do think that he could be a bit of a uh, an, an effective shutdown center um, in, in a way come playoff time. So, yeah, not a huge fantasy asset at all, um, but a, a solid hockey move, I think, for a team that really needed a, a third line center and then has, um, you know, just just no fantasy value at all. Do the Kraken play the Stars at all? Can they pull their goalie for an entire game and, and help Lundqvist get the uh, the twenty some odd points he needs to to hit that condition? Uh, that'd be, a, that'd be I awesome. Don't know. Imagine it's just a, a casual 30, 30 to three game. It's like no, we didn't change anything up. He's got a casual Imagine the twenty-four points. Fantasy point. implications that would have Ooh. during the fantasy playoffs. They actually too, have two. Yeah, they have two games left against the Stars on uh, March thirtieth and April thirteenth. Uh, couple so 12 yeah, point nights help him break oh. settlers record twice and he's there <laughs> he's why johnson almost imagine. did it with a goalie in the net yeah no kidding unbelievable stuff uh yeah i doubt that's gonna happen but it's certainly up in the air you never know uh everything they don't want it bad enough if they're not doing it these teams are still playing uh checkers and there's chess there to be played they just don't want it bad enough so funny if they just do it and nobody gives the puck to Lundqvist. He's just already healthy scratch because they're deep, their blue line's so deep now. It just doesn't even matter. Like, oh, Is I, it I, wrong I, that I'm worried even if they tried, he might not be able to get those 12 points in a game, boys? <laughs> <laughs> that might be the case, too. I know for sure, yeah. though, I'm, pu- I'm, I'm putting Niels Lundqvist in my DraftKings lineups uh, whenever the Kraken face the Dallas Stars moving forward. Um, and then the last deal, it hasn't come through. We don't have full details yet. I was hoping that we were going to, not that we would have been able to break it live on the show because the show is obviously recorded, <laughs> but insane. I was hoping that we were going to get some details on this trade uh, it looks like Noah Hannafin is going from the Calgary Flames to the Vegas Golden Knights. I am sure by the time you listen to this tomorrow, uh, this trade will be completely done. And uh, the only name that we know as of right now that seems to be going the other way um, is Daniil Miromanov, uh, who is a 26-year-old defenseman for the Vegas Golden Knights. So not a huge return there. Uh, there's certainly more chips to fall. And like I said, you guys will absolutely know them already tomorrow. Uh, but let's talk about Hannafin in Vegas. I, I, he, he's a name we talked about last week. He really had no chance of landing anywhere else and, and seeing much of a fantasy boost. Uh, and this certainly is, is not a spot where his fantasy value is going to rise. Um, Alec Martinez was placed on IR today. Um whether or not he goes to LTIR and open up more cap space wouldn't be surprising at all uh, for the Vegas Golden Knights. But, um, you know, I, I do think Hannafin can play some pretty big 5v5 minutes moving forward, whether it's, you know, form an injured Martinez, whether it moves McNabb down the lineup a little bit. He's going to factor into that top 4D for sure. Uh, but I just don't think he's going to see nearly the same amount of power play time uh, that he did in Calgary. He saw some power play one time throughout the season, uh, pr- pretty often on the second power play unit. So he he's probably not going to play a similar role, um, you know, on special teams. But at 5v5, he's still going to eat minutes. So I still think, you know, especially in leagues with, with some additional counting stats, Hannafin uh, can chip in there. But uh, he probably doesn't, you know, see a fantasy boost at all. Uh, he's currently 89 blocks, 46 hits. So Bangor League still providing you a, a little bit of extra uh, support there does have 11 goals, 24 assists, 35 points in 61 games. Goes to a better offense. I, I, I wouldn't be dropping him by any means, but I just don't think like you know. I, I think people will just look at this move and automatically think like, oh, he, he's going to a better team. His value is going up, and I just don't. I don't think that's the case. He's currently sitting at 67% owned. Uh, if he's out there, I think he's okay. Uh, he's a great real hockey defenseman. This is a great 
phenomenal addition for the Vegas Golden Knights. I don't know how they keep getting away with this. Insert the Jesse Pinkman gif uh, because it's it's unbelievable. But yeah, he he's a tremendous real life hockey player and an absolutely uh, terrific addition. Uh, Beebs, we'll start with you on this one because you are, as, as we've mentioned many times, our resident Avalanche fan. D mm-hmm. and myself are, are fans of Eastern Conference teams, so we hopefully won't have to deal with the potential wagon that is the Vegas Golden Knights until the Stanley Cup Finals. Wishful thinking that the Detroit Red Wings are even going to get there. Um, but uh, you obviously are going to have to face this team if you want to go to the Stanley Cup Finals, most likely. How do you feel about the Vegas Golden Knights doing it again? Yeah, well, as the resident Avalanche fan, I'm also the resident Vegas hater. Um, They come hand in hand. It's a role when you sign up for one, you sign up for the other. Um, But we can actually break some news on air right now. Um, There will be a third team involved. That was just announced a minute ago on the Hannafin deal. And that's needed because, you know, Vegas needs some salary retention. And uh, they always seem to pull off these incredible deals. I hated seeing it. I mean, who would have thought Vegas is taking the best defenseman off the board yet again? Um, The best maybe player off the board. Yet again, um, you know, it's uh, it, it's definitely not. It doesn't matter who they're sending away. It's going to be a move that improves them quite a bit. Fantasy wise, I, I like you kind of mentioned, I, I don't love it um, because you, you've gotten a lot of value out of Hannafin. And, and I'm in agreement that I think it's going to go down. Um, but yeah, hang tight. But as far as the team goes, Vegas is, is shoring up to, you know, if, if they can make the playoffs, they're going to make the playoffs. Um, but if they can, um, there was a little bit of worry there. Um, once, you know, they got Jack Eichel, he just came back. Um, things are starting to fall back in place for Vegas. It was looking a little scary for a bit there. Um, if they could get Mark Stone back for the playoffs, though, they are a different team. That's the big difference. <laughs> if though. they could get Mark Stone back. The guys yeah, sitting, know, on, know, so. sitting in Vegas by his pool, just chilling, waiting for playoff season. Jack Eichel's got to be pretty excited about this. I know him and Noah Hannafin are buddies. They played the... Uh, the Sandbagger Invitational together, uh, both Boston, Massachusetts guys. Um, they got to be excited to be getting paired together. I'm sure that uh, that was a big uh, part of, of acquiring Hannafin as well. I'm sure Jack Eichel had some pull there, but um, I love that. If Mark Stone comes back, he's got to be just fully healthy at the moment. No, he, I mean, we saw it, it was hilarious today. Um, Alec Martinez goes on the, on, on the IR and, uh, and even just seeing that we're so used to it that every comment we saw kind of filtered through and we broke that news. I don't think, I don't Twitter think the average was, fan knows who the difference between IR and LTIR though. Like they don't sure get any don't. salary relief until yeah. he goes on LTIR. So, <laughs> which um, was hilarious because the reactions were like, Oh, what's coming. And then yeah, like, he's okay, coming back game one of the playoffs for sure. It's like, he, he could come back next week and it would have no difference. <laughs> Same <laughs> but, implications. Um, yeah. But no, it's uh, yeah. Yeah. But either way, they've done it again. They've hoodwinked the NHL. Vegas, you're good. You're good at what you do. Me and D were talking about this pre uh, pre show. It's like, it's so funny to me still that like, they haven't tried to fix this really at all. And that the most important time of the season, the playoffs, the salary cap just doesn't exist. Like it's just it's fine. Just go out there. You can have a, you can have a two hundred million dollar roster if you manage LTIR properly, and uh, just just go ahead and win a cup. You deserve it. You 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 were cap compliant all year, but now it does not matter. D, uh, any further thoughts on Noah Hannah before uh, we wrap up the show? Well, if we're going to keep hating on on Vegas, and this one is less unique to them, I will say the double retention on trade seems a little bit ridiculous to me. I don't really see why that's allowed. Uh, it was great. It allows more trades to happen that a team can retain money on a contract, but these three-way trades just to get it down to a 25% cap hit, like I just don't understand why you have a hard cap in a league if there's all these ways to to get around it and circumvent it, not even just in the playoffs, but leading up to it as well. Um, and I say that as you know, someone, a uh, Maple Leaf fan who was fortunate enough to get the great Ilya Labushkin on like a $30 cap hit. Um, because of the 75% retention. So, but yeah, that, just another thing that just doesn't make sense. There just seems to be so many ways to get around the hard cap that completely go against the spirit of it. And I just don't understand the purpose of it. Let's just do a luxury tax and let the best teams be the best teams and, and pay the rest of the shitty teams um, for, for really taking advantage of, of their money and the assets that they have. But anyway, um, no Hannafin, I, I think it's interesting. Um, the Golden Knights really haven't been a great possession team uh, at 5v5 this year. They've I, honestly, their struggles have been a little bit masked by the fact that they've gotten such fantastic goaltending, namely out of Aiden Hill for Thompson at times as well. Um, but obviously, you know, getting the guy like Hannafin is going to go a long way to improve that. Um, that being said, I, I think 
you know, in traditional fantasy formats, the ones that don't account for things like hits and block shots, I do think Canathan's value goes down. He probably doesn't have a spot on the power play at all anymore. Whereas in Calgary, he was getting time with the second unit. Uh, however, in, in more, or I guess in deeper category leads, things that reward stuff like hits and block shots, there might actually be more opportunity for him to rack up those stats even further, um, simply because, believe it or not, the Flames were a, a pretty demonstrably better team um, at 5v5 in terms of controlling the puck and getting shot attempts off uh, than the Vegas Golden Knights have been this season. So there might be even more time that the opponent has the puck and for Hannafin to do his thing and rack up the hits and rack up the block shots. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind there. I think he's going to continue to be really good in the formats where he's excelled this year, uh, but you may not get that the kind of the, the cherry on top that he's been able to provide with some offensive production because I doubt he takes over for either Shea Theodore or Alex Petrangelo on the power play. Double-digit goals for Noah Hannafin in two of the last three seasons. So he's he's turned into one of those guys that can just kind of Put in Super 10 underrated. goals with 30 plus assists every year. It's, uh, it, it, yeah, he's been kind of an underrated fantasy asset for sure. Um, but that is going to do it for the fantasy part of this show. The, we're going to close up the show with the Betway bets of the day, and we are going to send you on your way and enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy the fun that is the trade deadline week in the NHL. We'll be back next week to break down all of the trades that happened. But without further ado, let's get to the Betway bets of the day. Looking at the board right now, honestly, there's not a whole lot that I absolutely love on tomorrow's slate as of right now until we get some news. Uh, but the one, two games that I like, uh, Nashville minus 154 at the moment uh, at home against the Buffalo Sabres. This is a Buffalo Sabres team that is currently playing this evening in Toronto. So a back-to-back -back for them. Uka Pekalukin is starting tonight which most likely means Eric Comrie tomorrow. Uh, Pekka, Luka Pekka-Lukin has basically been the only chance the Sabres have had recently. And if he's not starting, uh, the National Predators had their ridiculous hot streak come to an end against the Canadians last night. Uh, so I'd expect them to get back in the win column. So minus 154 on home lines against the Sabres team on a back-to-back. -back. Also good, uh, a good idea typically to target teams that are not just on a back-to-back, -back, but are traveling uh, across border. So from uh, Canada to the United States like the Sabres are doing uh, in this game. So, uh, yeah, I like the Predators minus 154 at the moment. Uh, whether or not that line sticks around by the time you listen to this or not, uh, we shall see. Uh, next is the Vancouver Canucks I like on the road in Vegas, minus 105. Uh, pretty even split here. Uh, but, yeah, like we said, this Vegas Golden Knights team is circumventing the cap with all their injuries. The problem is they're dealing with a lot of injuries. Uh, so that is an issue. Obviously, if they do acquire Noah Hannafin, there's no guarantee that he'll be available tomorrow. Obviously, again, being uh, traded from a Canadian team to an American team, uh, there are typically some visa-related issues. We saw it with Chris Tanev, missed a couple of games following his trade to the Dallas Stars. So, uh, yeah, no Mark Stone, obviously. No Alec Martinez now. Uh, if, if Hannafin doesn't get traded there and, and Ur isn't eligible to play it following this trade, then, yeah, their blue line is going to be looking a little thin, already pretty thin up front. So uh, I like the Vancouver Canucks minus 105 heading into Vegas tomorrow as well. As of right now, probably the only two games that I'm looking at because, yeah, there are a lot of heavy favorites tomorrow. Um, and there's just obviously as we get close to the deadline, you got to be picky and choosy with your spots because uh, there are a lot of teams that could just randomly decide to sit guys uh, like today. I, I had no intention on betting on the Ottawa Senators, but all of a sudden, you know, big trade for, for the Anaheim Ducks. Then they announce a couple guys are out for injury and – You've got a Couple. very short-handed Anaheim Ducks team. Uh, the one thing that made me very nervous, just really quickly, about that bet was everybody was like talking about how many bodies are missing from the Anaheim lineup, and everyone was like, "Oh my god, uh, smash the Sens, bet the Sens, bet the Sens." But then that was just your casual fan. Every single Sens fan that came onto the on Twitter and saw the tweet were like, "Oh yeah, we're getting shut out seven nothing." So I was like, "Oh." What do they know that I don't? These guys watch this team every single night. There's no way this goes well. But anyways. Uh, Anaheim did oh. just announce their starting goalie as the Dost Wall. So I don't think you're beating that thing, dude. That's off their official account. So I yeah, don't know. Dude, he's, he's, got, he, he's got like five games over 50 saves. That yeah. Pretty sure. So he's been unbelievable. But yeah, I will uh, I will lock it in here. Give me the Nashville Predators uh, minus 154 and the Vegas, uh, sorry, the Vancouver Canucks minus 105. And those were your Betway bets of the day. Thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. This was season nine, episode 34 of the DFO Fantasy Podcast. Enjoy the rest of the week. Enjoy the trade deadline. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you guys back here next week.
Let's hope we have some juicy trades to talk about. Fantasy stuff. Peace. What's up, hockey fans? If you enjoyed that video, then you need to be hitting the subscribe button right here at Daily Faceoff. Exclusive interviews and analysis from our hockey insider, Frank Zaravalli, fantasy updates from Brock Sagan, and a daily live show at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss any of the fantastic content, so hit that subscribe button.